Welcome to the Equipping Leaders podcast, Leader Study Series. I'm Natasha, a leader development professional and overall leadership enthusiast. And I'm Corey, a program manager and an emerging people leader, thus a leadership enthusiast. We are doing a leader study of the TV show Z Nation, deconstructing the leaders, decisions, and team dynamics of the characters on the show. To look at how leadership is all around us, and even if we're not in a position of leadership, we can still demonstrate it in our actions, responses, and opportunities. Z Nation aired from 2014 to 2018, but if you haven't seen it yet, there will be spoilers in these episodes. In this episode, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 7, Welcome to Murphy Town. Let's jump in. Okay, so now we're going to skip ahead a couple of episodes because we have an episode where 10K is going through his own internal thing where he thinks he sees red and 5K again. And, you know, he's he is dealing with that. And then we get into an episode where Doc is and 10K are essentially in a place that's an institution run by a very like nurse ratchet type person. But then we get to season three, episode seven, which is welcome to Murphy town. And so now we have, oh, Murphy. Oh, Murphy. I was a sympathizer and (laughs) he has turned me against it. But we start this episode where there's someone chasing using zombies essentially to chase down somebody in the woods, which I think is just an interesting turn that Murphy town has taken. So, um, but I will turn it over to you. What were some of your takeaways from this episode? A couple obviously, right. But I think one of the things that stood out to me the most is uh, from a, a team leadership company organization perspective. They do everything right to create the facade of being somewhere you would want to be, right? So upon arrival, um, they have a what seems like a very organized process of, you know, they check you out, you tell them what skills you have, they give you the vaccine, they've got a place for you to, you know, um, uh, the vaccine makes you a little sick, right, to, to take care of it right there. They have the security thing, every one of the, like, uh, Murphy town people is wearing almost like a uniform, right? Like all kind of black or whatever. They give it the facade of being organized, well thought out. And we know it's chaos and misery sort of behind the scenes. And I think, I think that is a tactic used by a lot of, uh, a lot of organizations and companies. They, right, they make the lobby very pretty, but once you finally get into the to the office or whatever, you know what I mean. The, the cracks start to form when you're on your Commodore 64, you know, dialing up to the internet. Um, it's like a weird place to spend resources. Instead of making the environment better for the team as a whole, they make it look good for people that aren't even a part of the team yet, that that are are, are contributing nothing. So I I think that that was sort of an interesting. Um, visualization also you you have murphy now kind of handpicking who comes in and who doesn't right it's not about saving everyone it's about saving the people who have the skills that he needs to grow his vision and i i get that right i'm not gonna you know if i own a company i'm not gonna hire everybody just because i want everybody to have a job right we still have goals and they you have to line up to those goals but it's a little different than a company, right? This is a supposed society that you're building. So it's like only those you deem worthy of your society can join. Not very civil. Right. And I think also something that happened a couple episodes ago in the one where 10K was kind of working through some stuff was we found, Murphy found out that, so after Dr. Merch had walked into the thing of zombies and then they had retrieved her body, he found out that he could essentially get gain whatever knowledge she had by eating her brains. And so that's how now, even though they no longer have Dr. Merch, Murphy's still able to make that blend vaccine so that they can um, continue to bring these people in. So that was a an important piece there. And also, as they're looking at these different people and their vocations, we have a reemergence of a previous character who is the man. And so he is now essentially, we know that he has 
Murphy on a piece of paper, right? He's now on his list. And so now he's actually actively in the area trying to see, trying to kind of do his own recon and see how he can get Murphy. Circling back, wild point. Just go with me on this because I want your input. Um, so Murphy ate Dr. Murch's brain. Mm -hmm. Seemingly was able to come up with the vaccine, Murphy himself, instantly after gaining that knowledge, right? Was, do you think that she already knew how to make the vaccine and like even with the Murphy bite was fighting to make it because she knew it wasn't a good thing? Do you think that Murphy seeing essentially like if we look at that as a I hate to use the term because I hate when my where I work uses it, but the TEM, right, the technical exchange meeting, I would argue that eating someone's brain is an odd format for the meeting, but we'll go with it. Do you think that the TEM and Murphy being able to approach the problem from a different perspective allowed him to come up with the answer faster than she could right because sometimes you just need that other set of eyes on the problem to look at it through a new lens and or do you think that murphy's motivation to get the vaccine was stronger than dr Murch's? so the motivation is what spurred the invention i think it was all within dr Murch, and i think that she had like probably just figured it out uh, so then when Murphy ate her brains, he was able to then immediately have the answer. Because but if we go back to that episode a little bit, he is walking around looking at her notes while he's eating her brains and being like, oh, yeah, this makes sense because you need this and this. So using the knowledge that she had, he was actually able to then figure it out. And but to your point, he was also more motivated to make 10,000 vaccinations. Right. So once he had the knowledge, she could have walked through it more slowly to try to prevent what Murphy was trying to do, whereas he was going to charge forward. So I think it was a combination of both in that sense, where it's like she had the knowledge. She wasn't going to steamroll ahead the way he was. And then once he had the knowledge, he could steamroll ahead as quickly as he wanted to. Yeah. No, I was just trying to think from like a team dynamic, right? Try to get more, sometimes getting more people involved, right? If you have a problem, sometimes that can be great because you get a lot of different, you get get a lot of different viewpoints very quickly. You know what I mean? Or a lot of the wrong answers, potentially, right? You could get the right answer right off the bat, but you can fail faster with more people to get towards the right, you know, uh, remove those variables. But yeah. also sometimes you get too many people and the problem gets worse. You know what I mean? So right. overcomplicated. Right. That's such a great point because there's an aspect where we want as many people as possible to have a voice but also I think people confuse a voice sometimes with a vote or a veto. Yeah. And so it's like, we want your voice. Like we want to know all these different perspectives, but it's kind of like when people give you one another feedback, they're like, well, I gave them this feedback and they didn't change. So what you were, what you were doing was you were demanding a change. You weren't giving them feedback. Right. So it's like people also, and then also on the other end, when people get feedback, they're like, Oh, I need to change this. Well, if you just res are, are constantly responding to everyone's feedback, nothing really is going to happen. You need to take feedback, of course, but just because somebody gives you feedback doesn't mean that you have to take it. So yeah, I think that there's an element too of whose voice is in the room. And while somebody who maybe is not an expert in something can give a really great perspective, it doesn't mean that trying to respond to every single person and make sure every single person is happy and content can be it's, uh, I mean, I don't want to say it's a cliche, but it is a fool's errand. You didn't want to say it, but you did it anyway. It. <laughs> so, no, I, so, so I took us off, off topic there, but that got, it just sort of got me thinking about, you know, the whole too many, too many people talking at once sometimes is, is not as beneficial as you want it to be. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the, um the man is back and uh i also think that what's interesting about the man is as you know we, we understand that his motivations are never um never good right like he's not doing anything for for good reason so i i also think that it's interesting because uh 
Murphy kind of got very loud about an idea before it was fully formed out and brought a lot of attention onto himself. And I've, um, like if, like, if we said, like, let's just say he was doing something good, right? Sometimes as a leader, and I've, I've been guilty of this myself, especially just because I'm, I, you know, as I'm learning, sometimes a team member or somebody will have a great idea um, that they haven't fully fleshed out yet. And like, you're excited for that idea and you want to show support and you try to maybe amplify that idea to other leaders or, you know, up the chain, you know, so, so to speak. Um, and you can put that person under like a lot of pressure or anxiety and maybe they weren't ready for that. And maybe, or maybe the, maybe it wasn't a fully fleshed out idea. Right. And like, uh, one more hour of thinking about it would have realized it's not feasible or something, you know? Um, and so now you've kind of made them look a fool and made yourself look a fool and, and created this in, like thing. So I just thought that was interesting with the Murphy piece of he got so loud about this Murphy town and hasn't really figured it all out a hundred percent yet. And now it's getting eyes on it and it's starting to get a little overwhelmed. Like we said, the sort of cult followers outside of the gate that are causing issues and breaking down the fence that he's trying to build. And now you have uh, the man who's come here and, and I, you know, we know he's got a lot of resources and it's kind of, a. I think it's only alluded to at this point, right. About kind of Zona and that whole tie in, but like, he's brought a lot of visibility on a plan that hasn't been fully fleshed out yet. And I think, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but I, I think it's really interesting. Yes. I, I, I'm always torn when it comes to like, no plan is ever really fully fleshed out, right? Like things will adapt as you go. But I, I think that there is a lot of utility in being more clear, like either, Hey, I'm going to say something. It's not a complete thought, right? So you could even start with something like that. But then also like along the way to say like, here are where the updates come. Here is where decision points will be. Or, you know, at each like kind of a uh, meeting point or touch point, here's where we are. Here's what the next things are. Here are the next decisions that need to be made. Because I think that sometimes people, they get so caught up in being like, I have to have the whole plan. Pointless. And then you spend all this time planning and no time doing and I know there's like a lot of military quotes around that too, you know, like a, a good plan executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. Uh. So <laughs> I think that was General Patton who said that. Um, but, but I think that's really important to remember is that I think so many things get lost or die when they could have gained more traction and you want to use the excitement and the motivation of the people around you to keep something moving forward and you don't have to have all the answers. Because the other thing too, is if you do have all the answers and you're like, oh, here's the plan. As soon as you hit something that is counter to that, either the project dies or you go back into a completely new planning cycle and the project dies, right? Something that should have taken three months takes six years and everybody hates it and doesn't want to be a part of it. So I'm, I'm always a fan of if there's something that could, you know, that has the potential to have legs, at least like get out there so that people can a punch holes in it. That's totally fine. You want to know what those things are going to be, but at the same time, what else, like people, when they get excited about things, they'll offer additional support and additional insight too to help move it along. Right. They'll be your champions for getting it done. Interesting. You could have just said you disagreed and we could have <laughs> gone, but no, I appreciate that path. No, I'm kidding. That's a that's a really great point, though. I guess it, again, I also think it comes down to the organization that you're in. Because in mine, you know, I don't always have the um, don't always have the support, right? A very fiscally um, focused organization, right? So it's like, is this going to produce more money, or is this going to save us money? Um, if yes go for it. If not, now we need to do a whole, we need to assess, right? Why? What's the benefit of this? What's the ROI? And that whole, you know, it's one of those sort of things. So I think that's also a really great point. And it goes back to what we had talked about, I think a few episodes ago about like, kind of what's your environment, right? Like what kind of environment are you trying to lead in? And that's also going to change or affect the way that you, you kind of move forward. So find a new job. Got it. But, um, <laughs> So I think the other thing we we have is Doc 
um, is getting circled back up with the group because he had kind of been separated from them for a little while. Um, and so now you're getting all of like bite marks sort of back together again. Um, and I think that that's pretty cool too, because they're all excited to be back together. They're all excited to work together. They kind of exchange information, recent experiences. So, um, I, I think it's cool. It's almost like doc went away on a business trip and came back and was like, these are all the things I learned from that business trip. What did you guys do while I was go Oh, we did these things. So I just think that's really fun that they enjoy seeing each other. And something else really important happens there too, where when Doc and 10K are reunited with the group, 10K does not want Roberta to know that he's been bitten. And so, you know, Doc is like, you could trust Roberta, you should tell her, because she's already suspicious because he's starting to say kind of some, just things that 10K wouldn't say. And then, you know, Doc is really encouraging him to tell her because, you know, we've been able to trust her so far and he just wants to not say that part but he just say all the part about all the parts about like how murphy's building his compound in like spokane and you know all the different stuff that murphy's planning on doing but he he doesn't reveal that one piece there which i think is really interesting so him not revealing that what are your what's your what are your thoughts on why he didn't do that Nobody wants to be othered from their social group. And not everybody was wild about Cassandra when she was a blend person. And so I think that there's that fear there. And he thinks also that he can maintain control of it. So even though this is not the same situation at all, it just kind of reminds me of like a functional alcoholic where they're like, oh yeah, no, I've got control of this. I, nobody needs to know about it because I do have it under control or I'm getting it under control. And there's this illusion essentially of control. And so I think that's where 10K is, where he still thinks he has control over it. And he's not realizing that he's saying and doing things that are like, no, you don't, right? You absolutely do not. Um, and so that's also where I see Roberta really getting that suspicion of, she doesn't know what it is. So now you have this person who's acting really strange. You know, they're withholding information. How do I, you know, how do I navigate this? So you even see her, not hesitating, but not engaging as fully as she normally does because she's trying to figure out like, is this you needing space or is this me needing to come down like a hammer and figure out what it is that's going on? Yeah, that's it's interesting. I, I my thing was the Cassandra thing too, because it was also he he was the one who was, I think, one of the more most upset about her. And now to become the thing that he was the most upset about. And because I think the other thing, too, is he's very vocal about it's not Cassandra anymore. Right. Like that's not Cassandra. They didn't want to call her Cassandra. Now to be in that same boat, like you said, he doesn't want to be the odd man out. But he made such a strong stance on she's not her that, you know, that would also now mean that he's not him. And I, I think that that's very, you know. Sometimes you can talk yourself into a corner and boy, oof, am I familiar. So <laughs> that is that that's I, I sympathize with him a lot. You know what I mean? On that one. I think that's very interesting. Yeah. And then as they're kind of going about, they see this Murphy campaign truck, right? Or they hear it. And again, he's leaning into that fear no more thing. So I think the truck says like, fear no more, guaranteed. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but then we also get another interesting inner like interaction where when they catch up to the vehicle, it's obviously been attacked by the red hand, right? So they learn a couple of things here too. So they learn that anybody who has this blend vaccine, once they are unalived, they don't come back as a zombie. So they learn that from seeing this interaction. And then, um, so they see that. And then they're also seeing that, like, Murphy's now actively trying to draw people to him by making this ridiculous promise. And the reason why I say ridiculous promise is it just reminds me of those workplaces where they're like, unlimited PTO. We're like a family here. And they're saying all these things that you're like, those things on the surface sound like good things. When in reality, 
those are not great things. I don't want to say they're like wildly toxic. They can be, of course, but uh, at the same time, it's like fear no more guaranteed. You can't, you can't make that guarantee, right? Like unlimited PTO. What is that? What does that mean? And what else does that cost? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You made, made me laugh thinking about uh, the movie Elf when he's like, this is the world's best cup of coffee. It's like, you guys did it. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Um, sorry, my brain goes in a million directions. I also, um, we're circling back up with Citizen Z, right? One of my favorite uh, characters. And I think what's cool is he's got his own little team now. You know what I mean? Um, so he's got Kaya in the sky. He's got uh, Grandma and uh, goes by Uncle, I think, or something like that. Uh, that you know. They're making their way back, right? They're figuring it out, right? Uncle's got these strengths with like, um, uh, like electrician type of skills, right? Which is a need. There, I, I just think I don't know. I, I'm excited about that too because they also went back to a place that's got more resources. Um, so uh, and he's gonna be able to get back, uh, helping out uh, the um, uh, Operation Bite Mark team. So I just think like that's a, uh, um. I think that's pretty cool, right? Because he's been so he's been remote for so long and been so isolated. Um, that now he's got like people, and I think that that's something. You know, when I first, uh, you know, I don't tend to do super great with remote work because I I tend to be very much like I need that engagement um, from from folks around me. And for me, I I like that like um, boy, physical engagement. I think is the right way to say it, but it's not the right way I want to make it sound. But uh. I need like actual people, right? Like the Zoom call thing doesn't doesn't always do it for me. And so I don't know. I think for that piece, like is energizing working around other people, especially people you like. Um, and so now he's got people he likes to kind of work around and do things with. So I think that's pretty cool too. But knowing that knowing the environment you need to be successful. Yes, that's such a great point because sometimes people think, oh, well, I can. Like, like you said, I know, you know that you need to be around people. You like that social aspect, that extroverted aspect of work that is energizing to you. Uh, and then there's somebody like me who that's very draining to me. <laughs> like, I just need to manage my energy in a way that I cannot if I'm always in an office. Doesn't mean I don't like seeing people. I'll absolutely meet people for lunch. I don't mind going in the office like one day a year. But at the same <laughs> time, it's like that all the time. I cannot be as productive as I can be on my own. Um, so yeah, but but I think you said it well where it's like, yeah, you have to know how you best operate. And then how do I create that in the environment that I have? So do I need to go into an office more? Do I need to meet with people more in person? Or, you know, how do I split that up? But understanding yourself and how you operate is really valuable. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go, go, go. I was going to say, so now... We also learn, because 10K reveals, that Murphy is going to try to get his daughter, Lucy. He's trying to retrieve her from her adopted parents. And so Sun May is around, and she's also believing that Lucy probably inherited that immunity. So she's also additionally valuable. So Roberta is, still has the mission to get to Murphy. And then she also has a secondary mission now of get Lucy before Murphy does. So she sends Doc and Addie to go get Lucy. And um, then Roberta, Sun May, Hector, and 10K, they're like, we're going to go try to stop Murphy in this thing that he's doing. And so I thought that was like, really again, the team splits up. Nobody likes it when they split up. But another thing, and I don't think it was this episode, it may have been a previous one, where Murphy brought up the point that if 10K, if they didn't see that 10K was actually no longer living, then he probably still was. And then he made a very telling comment where he said, he's going to go find Roberta or he's going to go find Warren and then they're going to come here. And just that, like the, the heaviness of how he said that statement, knowing that like, who can stop Murphy? It's Roberta, right? Roberta is the one. It's not even that whole group. He knows it's Warren. Warren is going to be the one who can stop him. So I think that's really interesting because then like now moving forward here, they don't have 10K with them. 
And so they're like having this meeting about trying to bring the power back on. And that's when he says, start a basic training program, right? He tells that one former drill sergeant upcycler that. And so I thought that was really interesting too, where it's like, he's almost like starting to see the holes in what he is trying to create. And instead of fixing anything, he's like, let's just keep fortifying and for Let's just keep throwing things at it instead of fixing it. We'll put a thousand band-aids on it and try to keep them out. But I thought that was just really interesting, like such a stance to take. That was a lot. Sorry, I just like kind of sped through several things. I'll stop. <laughs> I don't even know what happened. Um, <laughs> I, think there's, I think there's zombies in this episode. Um, Is Murphy the uh, main person uh, here? <laughs> like <it's, laughs> I, um, yeah, no, I, all like wildly great points. Um, that that you made there very quickly um but uh the uh yeah so i i also think like with the so with the war and peace let me gather my thoughts because you you dropped a lot there um the <laughs> don't laugh at me <laughs> i'm not i'm just laughing because i didn't realize how fast i went until i stopped and i was like man i saw a lot of stuff there <laughs> okay so with Murphy and his comments about Warren. I also picked up on that and the sort of the dread in his voice, right? That like, but I, it, what I thought was interesting is he does not, he didn't do anything good. Like he didn't do anything right. And he knows that he's admitting to his own guilt because if this was truly a living, no fear, he does have a tremendous power and ability and, and he's done for the sake of argument, he's done exactly what the mission was supposed to be. He created or should have created a vaccine, right? He completed the mission, not single-handedly, but for the sake of the argument, he did it single-handedly. He's creating a zombie-free utopia with people who are immune from becoming a zombie. When they die, they are uh, when they unalive or mercyed, whatever, they don't become um, a zombie, right? Like they're they're cured. And he's creating utopia. He's creating a hydroelectric power and growing plants and et cetera. And, but none of it is being done with like the best intentions. And if it was, he would have to fear no one because the good would overcome it. Roberta would never be able to touch him because everyone would come to his defense and his aid um, because he's a good leader. But he's not, right? He He's not. So it's like that to me was his own admission. and. It's just that was, you know, it's crazy. Um, so same thing. You wouldn't need an army. You would need a basic training program if you, if you weren't doing good. And, you know, that's just that is what it is. Right. Um, uh, so that one point, I think, was is really interesting. Um, the divide and conquer piece for Lucy, I also think is. um what that's a great strength of Warren, right? She has a lot of faith and she understood who would need to go there, right? So Addie should go with um Doc. Uh 10K is a weird variable, like we said, right? She's getting weird vibes from him. She did not send him out there. She could have split that team up evenly, sort of a three and three, but um uh she realized that she was like 10K had to stay with them. You know what I mean? Um because why send him out because I'm sending these other people out remote. They don't need that stressor. He can stay with us. So I thought that that was just really great sort of placing out the team there and putting the strengths where the strengths need to go. Um, and she put, I think Addy and Doc are interesting from a team dynamic because Addy's, she's kind of like a hammer, right? She's a compassionate hammer, but she's a hammer. And Doc is sort of a, he's like, not a hammer he's also very compassionate but he's more of like let's talk this out so she sent two great sort of uh generalized skills out on this mission right somebody to talk him out of a bad situation and somebody to you know get them out of a bad situation um and i thought that that's that was like a really smart like matchup because to send sun may or hector or anyone else might not have been the best for that situation. You know what I mean? But for those skills to be with Warren, 
the sort of advisor because now they're going to make more of like a strategic decision on this Murphy Town thing. I think that that was really like those great leadership in resource allocation. I agree. No notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I completely agree that it was excellent resource allocation. And also with Addie being kind of like mentored to be the next leader, she yeah. can absolutely do things on her own. So yeah, great points. But then the, so the other thing too, if, if we're just speed running through this episode uh, is, um, so you have the man. Um, and what I think is so interesting is um right uh murphy had the system in place right uh that he thought had these sort of like checks and balances of like once you get the shot normally people would uh upchuck right it was like a very high probability there'd be this control he would be able to control them so he could figure that out very quickly about telling them to do something and if they didn't do it then the shot didn't work or they needed more of a dose or something like that so quickly did that fall apart right with the man he was so easy to, for him to um, subvert those basically security measures. And I think having too much confidence in something and not checking and double checking and um, like, uh, you know, red teaming it, right? So playing the adversary, trying to break the thing that you just built, you know, Murphy just, that that's that arrogance that, that tends to come back and bite you. And I, I think that that's like, it's very interesting. I also think it was interesting that he was so. Uh, he knows the power that the man has, right? Resources, just general physical strength, um, like mental, the wrong kind of mental toughness, right? But uh, able to do some some pretty um, atrocious things without really thinking too much about it. And also was the closest thing that that Murphy had ever seen to someone who almost beat Warren, right? Like, so he knows Warren's coming for him. He thought the risk of taking this guy in would outweighed the risk of Warren, which I don't know how, I I, I know what I want to say. I just don't know how to say it because we were talking so fast this episode. But um, the, uh, like, that's so, caught, you know, like, looks all good. Like, as a leader, sometimes, like, if I could just get this one developer, if I could just get this one person, because their resume is great and like it's a huge risk, but let me spend all my budget on getting this one person who's going to solve all of my problems. And then, you know, I won't have to worry about training up the rest of the team anymore. I'm not going to worry about this thing because I'll have that one, you know, designated hitter to come in and solve the problems. Like, oh boy, what, what a dumb call. But I don't know what your thoughts are on any of that. I like all of that because I think that you're right. It's very much like, is this known entity that is strong that I perceive as being as strong as Warren or, you know, at, close to that type of strength that's valuable. Also, he came in acting like he had not, he was no longer working for Zona, you know, it was like this whole new thing. So even though that is highly suspicious because of what you said, like of his wanting to have something some sort of additional power with Warren or with whatever it was that he was working on at that time, he was willing to not dig that deep into it. And then he gave him a test where he told him, you know, here's what I want. I want brains, right? That's what I'm looking for. And he told it to him a little bit in confidence because he hadn't told other people. And the man immediately delivered, right? Which is another piece where it's like, yeah, so he did this. He just proved the skill that's valuable to Murphy. And that's all Murphy cares about is, is it valuable to him? And so in being able to demonstrate that so quickly and Murphy's willingness, whether it's hubris or a willingness to overlook someone's past or their flaws, it then led to other things for them. But essentially them, I don't want to say having him on their team, but him being part of the compound, at least temporarily. Yeah, I, I also think that not only did he like get those those brains like so quickly. But like, I think that it was interesting too, because M Murphy, it, it was like the new shiny, you know what I mean? Like Murphy was, they sacrificed somebody who was loyal, right? Like that was, 
done quickly just to to get and, and that like um that like invigorated him in a weird way right like how quick the man was able to get those those brains like that it was a weird i don't know it's like he found his dark soulmate you know what i mean like it was a that was a very interesting thing so yeah but the man doesn't it's not like he takes he's not into the long con <laughs> nope, is yeah. very quick so there's the little girl that murphy had originally bitten whose family came back and wanted the, him to bite them too who are major players in this compound and so uh the man mistakenly thinks that that little girl i think her name is cassie but the man mistakenly thinks that that's lucy yeah. and so he tries to manipulate murphy and and get murphy to come with him and then when Murphy sees that it's Cassie, then he is able to get the other hand. Um, but before he can really do anything then with the man, before he can like dole out a punishment or anything, something amazing at Murphy Town happens, and that is electricity. So they're able to get electricity turned on, all these beautiful lights. And so that draws them away from the area where they now have the man shackled uh, to like within the building. So I thought that was really interesting too, where again, they, we, we know the, the man is a known entity, a known bad guy and known for having his own ulterior motives. Murphy's willing to overlook that hubris, right? And then again, there's this person who is obviously like trained to do these insane things. And Murphy's like, we're going to put a pin in that. I want to see these lights. Right? So it's this like, it, again, it goes to his inconsistency as a leader, right? He just consistently makes bad decisions that are very self-driven, very like, what is this that's interesting and exciting and beneficial to me at any given point? And because of that, it just continues to put him in a slightly precarious situation. Yeah, I, that's a, that's a great point. Because then the, the old, there's, so I want to comment on that. The only other thing that I want to talk about is like the differences in meals too, between bite Mark and Murphy's people. I don't know if you picked up on that, but I think the other thing too, with like the electricity and the shiny where I, I see that the most is um, from like a development perspective, like, or within uh, the, like the tech, like tech industry is, is technical debt, right? So pushing technical debt to the side to, develop a new interface or do some sort of like really pretty update or or you know something that looks really cool that sells much better on um an update to executives than um oh we you know fixed all these budget uh bugs or you know we did this patch that you know solved this security issue or whatever that nobody cares about because there's no visible change to the product right yeah. so um electricity big visual change prioritize that over any of the technical debt like you know issues with the sort of followers outside we've sort of forgotten about the warren issue um and then when we talk about the the meals that you know because you go you jump back and forth between murphy's new team right where he's the leader of these people warren's team right bite mark and again the outside looks great like the outside perspective of um better meals wine fancy table they were eating and then bite mark was eating off a hubcap um and like i just think right like what you what is real versus what's that fake facade because when it came down to a team you know it, it was just like what what's your goal i just thought that was like a really uh, interesting painting yeah no, it's a great point because also people can be very easily seduced by things that look great. That building looks great. That person's wearing a suit. There is a larger meal here, right? Kind of going back to the Tobias guy. He seemed to have it all locked down, right? He was like, yeah. oh, there's this whole meal. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good call out too. Yeah, so then they... Uh, all the lights, right? Like we said, uh, all these distractions and you put it very well that it's like all these just things that are pulling them away from that. You called it like that technical debt. So then they go back and they find that the man has escaped. He has cut off his own hand in order to get away from this place. So 
again, he wasn't there long enough for it to be like a Dr. Merch type situation. But again, Murphy's hubris and his kind of lack of leadership and visioning and forward thinking in the things that are day to day and the things that matter, just it got lost. And so that known entity that is now another threat. So they got Warren, uh, this other threat of the man. Now they've got those things going on. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Um, and Murphy could have easily just eaten the brain and gathered that information, right, about Zona. That there, there are so many things that he could have done, but like you said, that that arrogance and hubris is really what um, kind of gets him every single time. But uh, yeah, it, like I said, now they've got the electricity and everything else. Now they're advertising even more, right? So they all this technical debt, they're advertising this great product that actually is never going to fulfill um, and I think that, you know, makes for some interesting uh, future engagement. Yes. And I also like they said that like that it's never going to fulfill. But isn't that the narcissism and the hubris of some leaders where they're like, this is totally going to happen. This is 100 percent going to happen. And it's almost like they've been told that as a leader, you're supposed to be optimistic. Right. You're supposed to be have a positive outlook. But then it's like, yeah, but like to what end? Like you, you should be positive. You should give people hope. But at the same time, you can't be unrealistic, especially if you're the leader. You have to be sure there are a lot of possibilities, but what can I give you right now? Right. What can I actually deliver right now? And other things will come in the future. But I think that's also an interesting thing where, again, it's this like no more fear guaranteed. And in fact, yikes, <laughs> a lot's going on. Awesome.